Thank you for coming here today. Thank you, Michelle, for putting this together. This is just a wonderful space and opportunity to meet as creatives and creators. And it's a pretty rare thing. So I appreciate this more than you all know. My name is Nadine Johnson. I'm from San Francisco, California. I've been working in design since I was a teenager, and I absolutely love it. It's had its ups and downs. During the pandemic, one thing that happened for me was to get a little deeper into what's called Web3, the metaverse, NFTs, crypto, all that great stuff. I've been in the crypto space since 2014. I felt as if I came in late, and now I'm considered uh, one of the I don't know, OGs of the space for no other reason than I came in before someone else. The wonderful thing about this space is that the longer you're in, the more you know, the more people you meet. Longevity makes a difference. So today I'm going to talk about what I call the Wild West of Web3, because it does feel a little wild and crazy. So let's go ahead and start getting into it. Where do I point this? There it is. <laughs> so we're going to start off by talking about Web 1, Web 2, before we even get into Web 3. And Web 1.0 was really um, old school. You remember the dial-up days. And it was read-only. Basically, we'd log in. Some of you may remember. Some of you were not born yet. Uh, it took a while to log in. It took a while to see anything. It took a while to even talk to anyone. And it was very slow and very clunky, but it felt like a whole new universe. Some of you who were adults at the time of this may remember that there were people who were so afraid of computers that they wouldn't even have computers in their businesses. I had a boss like that, and it took the accountant to tell her, computers are a good thing. But then we get into Web 2.0. And this is when the consumer became the product. With the emergence of sites like YouTube and eBay, it really brought us into not only being able to read and write, but being able to participate and contribute. But at the same time, our data, our information was being mined. And we're all really familiar with how Facebook makes its money, how Google makes its money. And that's where we are now. And there was a real breakdown of trust. And because of that breakdown of trust, we've gotten a little more into Web 3.0. And the key word that I hear as people talk about Web 3 is sovereignty. Being able to take control of their own data, being able to take ownership of the product as we are the product or what we create as the product. And what is Web3 has yet to be truly defined, although some people claim that they've already defined it. Some people are moving on into Web 4.0, Web 5.0. I don't think we're quite there yet. I think we need to let Web3 settle and figure out where we are. But it is a good start. And the wonderful thing about this space is that the future doesn't just seem right. It's almost technicolored. People are increasingly working together in this space to create meaningful experiences and products. Um, new communities are being born. I'm seeing people group together from all around the world for common causes. And we feel more like co-creators rather than just consumers in the product. So why do I call it the Wild West of 3.0? This is all really, really familiar. And you think about the gold rush days, um, this p image of the solitary miner and the mule mining for gold. This is our vision of what the riches of the gold rush were. But in reality, it was the people who bought the land, cut down the logs, the people who opened the stores to sell the picks and axes and shovels, the people who, like Levi Strauss and Jacob Davis, created the clothing that people wore, and the lovely ladies on the top who sold other things, became millionaires. So as we think about that, as we go into our topic of NFTs and the metaverse, 
I'm not going to talk specifically about crypto because that could take a few hours. And there are so many things about this space that you can do a deep dive into, and I implore all of you to do so. Do your own research. D-Y-O-R, Dior, is the mantra of the space. Do your own research. I can talk about DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. I'm a part of one. There are recently DACs, decentralized autonomous corporations, that are springing up. And there are a lot of people who believe that in the future, companies like Facebook, companies like Nike, should become DAOs or DACs. And what that means is that not that people have stock in the company, but they have stake in the company. And that's through the power of NFTs. All of this is built on the blockchain. The blockchain has been around for a very long time. And it's starting to be utilized in a way that's a little more digestible for the general public. And this is what we're seeing since the start of the pandemic. There are, thankfully, on three blockchains in existence. Two of them are open source. The blockchain that Bitcoin is on is open source. Um, it's open source is so important. Creative Commons is so important to share this information so that we can move on and create more on top of it. Before I go a little deeper, I'll talk a little bit about POAPs and POITs. These are things that are offered to people in this space. POAP, P-O-A-P, stands for Proof of Attendance Protocol. POET, Proof of Experience, I forget what the T stands for, but it's the similar thing. Where if you attend an event, if you're in a room on a chat space, uh, Twitter spaces, Clubhouse, you receive a poet just for being there. You can't fake it. And that goes back to the lack of trust. And that's what blockchain helps bring into the space. The wonderful thing about these poaps and poets is sometimes as they land in your crypto wallet, something else is linked to them. Uh, for example, I attended a poetry slam. They gave away a poet as part of it. And I ended up with Polygon in my wallet. I don't have Polygon as crypto, but now I do, and it's something I can spend on someone else's product as a result of just attending this event. It was a wonderful reward. So as we move forward and we specifically get into NFTs, why do we care about NFTs at all? You all remember this. And the collaboration between Board Ape Yacht Club affectionately called Bored Apes or Apes, and Adidas got a lot of attention. And it's because $22 million happened in less than 12 hours. That kind of gets your attention. And going back to the beginning of this group, it was four friends who got together and invested $40,000 in themselves of their own money to create a generative project. A generative NFT art project is basically the same image produced anywhere from three to 10,000 times with subtle changes to make each one slightly unique. They hyped this on audio app rooms such as Clubhouse, Twitter, well, Twitter spaces didn't exist at the time, such as Clubhouse, and got a community of people around them to believe in them. They presented this to the risk takers, to the first adopters, and FOMO quickly spread. Their fan base grew. Derivative projects were approved and created, such things as the mutant apes and other board ape derivatives came about, and other people were able to buy because the ape supply had run out. Holding an ape and using it as your PFP, your profile pick, became a flex, something that uh, you could brag about. The team is now known as Yuga Labs. Yuga Labs has become a huge powerhouse in the NFT space. They have acquired other really highly earning generative projects, including MeBits and CryptoPunks. These will become familiar as you get into the space. Then the next thing that happened was they dropped a coin. They created their own token. And for those who own a board ape, they received anywhere from 
1,000 to 10,000 of these ape coins, which at the time were worth one USD each. So instantly, $1,000 in your wallet for no other reason than the fact that you bought this NFT. The ape coin today is worth about 13 USD. So you got 1,000 ape coins dropped in your wallet because you bought an NFT. Now you have $13,000 in your wallet that you can spend on other things. It's a pretty amazing reward. And all that happened within a week. Mm -hmm. This generative NFT known as Board Ape Yacht Club is now an empire. They are actually creating their own metaverse. We'll get into more of that and how that happens a little later. And it's known as the other side. Yuga Labs was able to raise half a billion dollars in seed funding. And it's gonna be put to really good use. For those holders who have access to this metaverse, who can grow within the organization, it is a huge, huge opportunity. Their metaverse, known as The Other Side, has a wonderful trailer. The one thing that I love about this trailer is it includes all of the brands underneath the Yuga Labs umbrella. This is amazing branding. I would encourage you to take a look at it. It's available on YouTube. You can just Google BAYC, Board Ape Yacht Club, NFT, uh, other side, it will pop up. Sorry. The other th reason that we're paying attention to this is another generative NFT art project called Long Nikki Ladies. And I remember when Nyla's mother started coming into clubhouse rooms and talking about her daughter's artwork. Uh, her daughter loves pretty ladies and brontosauruses. <laughs> Thus, long, naked ladies. And it's super cute. Um, her mom was extremely smart and extremely strategic. She came into the space cold. She had no idea about the NFTs, but she heard it's a good thing. So she wanted to get her daughter into it. She met people, again, through the audio apps, and they came up with a plan to help her then 10-year-old daughter share her art on the blockchain. Long Nikki Ladies launched at a slightly higher than average price point, also very strategic. I think it was 0.07 ETH, and at the time that was close to $200. And personally, I'm not a fan of the artwork, so I didn't buy it. And I'm okay with that. Same thing with Bored Apes. I did not buy an ape, don't like the artwork. We'll get into that a little bit later. A lot of people who helped her, advised her, helped promote this plan, this project, were supported with a few pieces of artwork in lieu of monetary payment. That's the other thing about this community. Very warm, very welcoming, very um, willing to share. By the age of 11, Nyla had earned somewhere between 1.8 and 3.2 million US dollars. And today, she is the youngest Time Magazine artist in residence. This is why we're paying attention to this. I cannot tell you the number of parents who have said, my kid could do that. Maybe. But are you willing to work as hard as Nyla's mom did to make all of this happen? It's no surprise that Fortune Magazine is also paying attention. They have a list called the Fortune Nifty 50. Nifty spelled N-F-T-Y. The attention the space is getting is just unprecedented, and it's mostly because of the dollars that are being generated. NFT NYC is an event that happened for the first time last fall, took over Times Square. It was huge, a tremendous opportunity. Some of the featured artists were people who had never shown their art before, and the NFT space is the first time they've been able to really be seen. But the thing about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, is it's not just about the art. As awareness has grown, these various platforms, especially through audio apps such as Clubhouse and Twitter Spaces, but also Discord, Telegram, Reddit, and Twitch has really escalated the growth of communities and connections. And there are different ways that you can use an NFT. So it's not just creating a piece of artwork, it's not just the generative art examples that I've talked about, but it's also Selling an NFT as an opportunity for premium access. At NFT NYC, one of the main promoters sold um, a subway card, New York City subway card, as an NFT piece of art for about a little less than $200. He sold 5,000 of them. 
And those cards were access to the after, after, after parties that went on during the event. Some people just kept the NFT as a memorative uh, thing. Some people actually went to the parties. 5,000 at $200 each. Another great thing is community building. Some of you may recognize Gary V. Uh, he is an amazing person. Whether you think he's a scammer or a genius, the fact is that he has jumped into NFTs with both feet. He is innovative and lucrative in ways that his community sees as valuable. People who are a part of his community thrive. And it's not only because of the information that he shares, but also what he represents. The passionate parrot that you see on the slide is one of his NFTs. He just randomly hand draws things, gives it a name. These NFTs, again, are part of access. They are the holders of his NFTs are his community. They have access to things like his events, to the books that he writes, to a private YouTube channel, all of these things to solidify their base. People who are part of the VV Friends are a tight, close-knit community. If you are not a Gary V holder and you try to come into that space, you're going to be kicked out pretty quickly, only because they are just so passionate about what they do. And holding the NFT proves that you are a part of the community. Another new thing that's happening using non-fungible tokens is authentication. Luxury brands, especially for the secondary market, uh, attach NFTs to physical items as proof of authenticity. And it's not just for luxury. How do you make it for easier for consumers to return a cradle-to-cradle -cradle product if they aren't the original owner? With an NFT attached to a physical item with a unique smart contract, you can give rewards for buying on the secondary market, such as dropping coins if you choose to create a coin. You can also you know, give someone else a second NFT dropped in their wallet after they buy your initial NFT as a reward for holding an item even longer than its expected shelf life. So all of this is to say that NFTs, although the generative artwork is what's making the news, it's what's producing these huge dollar amounts. There are different ways you can use NFTs because they are just a token in your brand and in your product in a way beyond generative artwork. So as we talk about metaverses, and I'm gonna say metaverses and not the metaverse on purpose because it gets confusing. There's this brand that changed its name and a lot of people assume Facebook is the metaverse. Facebook changed its name to meta. They don't even have a metaverse um, at all. And it was very strategic, very smart. But the thing about Facebook is, although they don't have a metaverse or a space to climb into, they do have a near monopoly on the hardware to get into virtual reality. The Oculus is the lowest price point at $299, something teenagers can buy. Uh, their closest competition would be HTC, which I think the lowest price point is about $700. And Google is also working on new hardware, but it may take a little while. The hardware right now is pretty big. It's a little clunky. The haptic technology isn't there. It's hard to really feel anything when you're in a metaverse, except for those in the adult entertainment field. That's a whole nother discussion. But I would say if you're looking at what's going on and what's next level in virtual reality, look into the adult entertainment industry. What they're doing, they're always first adopters. They're always taking the technology to a new height, pushing things forward. So D-Y-O-R, do your own research there. I am not showing those slides. <laughs> And realize that metaverses can be accessed, not just through VR goggles, but through your laptop, through your cell phone. And this is something that sometimes gets missed. There are multiple metaverses, as I mentioned. Some of the most popular are Decentraland. Sotheby's has a space there. CryptoVoxels is really popular because you can also get a free plot. It's not easily accessible for others from the outside, 
but you can get your own little plot, build on it, and see what happens. Somnium Space is one of my favorites because it is so lovely. Um, and the Sandbox is another one. The thing to remember is a lot of this is coming out of the gaming industry. So it has a really familiar look for any of you who are gamers. One of the first VR spaces um, was Grand Theft Auto. And I found myself a year ago with people telling me, oh, you got to go check out this new comedy club. It's, you know, in VR. It's like, OK, where is it? It's in GTF. It's in GTF. OK, um, what's GTF? I'm not a gamer. Grand Theft Auto. And I thought, ooh, I got to go into Grand Theft Auto to get to a comedy club. OK, here I go. I went. Uh, it was hard to find. <laughs> I had to wa walk around. I got murdered a few times on my way there. <laughs> But it's okay, it was just VR. When I got into the club, there were big names, famous people who you have heard of. And the material was not suitable for work. And it was really interesting to see this whole new universe created within a game. So although these spaces are starting to price out as more people get into it, land on Decentraland, and some, uh, Decentraland, I'll say, about a year and a half ago, maybe you can buy a nice size plot for $500. Today, you're lucky if you can pay 5,000 for the same size. It's just spiking. But luckily, spaces like crypto voxels also allow you to come in and experience it without having to spend too much out of pocket. Some things are free. This is a screenshot of me in a virtual space in this somnium space in someone's art gallery. And the wonderful thing I love about the metaverses is that you can just kind of walk around. Very few restrict movement, but you can if you choose. So if you want to create a unique space that is just for your NFT holders, back to the NFTs, you can do so. And the NFT opens a door for people to come in, to see what's uniquely there for them. The word that I would use to describe the metaverse is wonderful. You can wander around and have a wonderful time. And it's as varied as the real world. No single company owns it or access to it. You can create your own metaverse, literally, just as Board Ape Yacht Club did. As I mentioned, it's accessible through VR, through AR, that is a type of metaverse. Headsets are not required, but if you do have a headset, you can have a much more immersive experience. So AR, augmented reality, is definitely the low-hanging fruit getting into the space. A lot of people were first exposed to it through Pokemon Go, and it's really familiar. Rebecca Minkoff is a really great example in the fashion space of using AR. Her sales increased, I believe, 30 to 40% when she started using AR to help people see themselves in the clothes, to virtually try things on. Wonderful example. I cannot stress enough. D-Y-O-R. Look up Rebecca Minkoff, what she does, how she does it. She is amazing in the space. Also with sustainable fashion, creating things on demand. But that's another topic. Education. This has been around for a while. We saw in the news about Stanford creating classes in their own metaverse, and that was really cool. But this has been used for years around the world. And as we rethink education, even as a brand, what can you offer? As you're educating the next generation of designers and sharing information and how to move forward, how can you use this? This particular screenshot is one of my favorites. It is a TCM, traditional Chinese medicine school, that has their students walk through virtual reality in order to literally go inside of the human body to learn more about their craft. Can you imagine walking through a factory instead of flying students to China to build shoes? Put them in VR and see how the factory runs in order to be better designers. Building architecture is another opportunity in this space. If you don't want to create your own space, you can build a house for someone else. 
Sotheby's had to hire someone to build a replica of their auction house in Decentraland. And it's a beautiful space, and it, it is exactly like in the real world. But you can do so much more. Blender is the most popular software that's used for this because it is open source, and it's free, and it's not too hard to use. There are definitely a lot of tutorials online, but also within this NFT Web3 community, there are people who are more than willing to teach you how to do basic things. Through crypto voxels, you can also build. There are sites called Magica Voxels and Mega Voxels Play that are nothing but ways to play around and have fun while learning how to build in these metaverses. I would say for those of you who are thinking, you know, I'm interested, I'm an architect, I'm an interior designer at heart, let me go ahead and do this, get a gamer laptop. One thing they won't tell you, although Mac has a monopoly on the design aesthetic, and we all are Mac users in some degree, you need a graphics card. You need a really good graphics card to be in this space. Another thing that's happening are events. Uh, Metaverse Fashion Week just happened last week, and it was beautiful, full of top names. It wasn't too crowded. You can see uh, just a tiny amount of people on the edge, and someone has an offense fantastic avatar with wings and a halo and a whole lot of things going on. Pretty beautiful. But it was interesting to watch Dolce & Gabbana, Estee Lauder, all of these really big name brands. Um, lots of hype. But after the event was over, I wondered, well, what's next? So I walked into Decentraland with my very boring avatar and I walked around. And the space was completely empty unused, and I thought, mm, that's an opportunity missed. I would love to just grab a group of fashion students. Let's go in and walk around and see what's going on. Grab a group of designers and say, let's meet up here. It's open, let's check it out. You can walk around the D&G store that's created right across the street from the space where the fashion week was held. And just take a look at how they do things and how they build things. It's pretty interesting but it feels like a waste, something that's unused. This is still sitting empty. And I sat in there for about 20 minutes. No one else was there but me. Continuing on with events, there are church services that happen every week in the metaverse, every Sunday. You can go to a Catholic mass. This couple got married last, late last year in the metaverse, and it made news because it was the first known metaverse wedding. But I would say, look at the tuxedo, the dress in real life versus the avatar. Kind of boring. That tuxedo looks ill-fitting, that wedding dress is boring. Which leads us into products. Wouldn't it be great if she could find a wedding dress designer in the metaverse to give her something pretty fabulous and amazing? Products aren't just about wearing a pair of Nikes or a Harley Davidson jacket in the metaverse. People want something different. A lot of people are really needing something more in the space. They don't, don't want to just replicate real life. And there are a group of people, especially those just coming into the space, who just want a D&G outfit that they pay a few thousand dollars for, or a couple of ETH for, and wear that around and strut it like a flex. But there are a lot of people who want to see the independent designers. This is a space that I was in with a few friends. Jagar, the person in the middle, this is his store. And you can see a lot of us are just naked and anonymous. And that's kind of how you enter crypto voxels. You have to buy the wearables in order to put on. So here he is coming in with his uh, t-shirt. He's showing off. He can change his skin color. He can wear a halo. He's got trainers. Earplug, who's another amazing designer. He's got his trainers on. And he's sort of like a weird Pez dispenser. I don't know what's going on there. But it's all him. Jagar starts showing off. Boom. He changes outfits. And he changes again and again and again to show off what he's built. And you can see in crypto voxels, things are very pixelated, but you can still put flames on a t-shirt. You can still create sombreros. You can even recognize the mask.
And finally, health and wellness in the metaverse. There are lots of big brands, wellness brands, that are already in this space, but they're just recreating a 2.0 experience while wearing a clunky headset, which is fine. You can go and do yoga with Alo in the metaverse. But I would say, moving a little more forward, think about things like Puma's active gaming footwear. Think about the products that people can wear to make them comfortable, to keep them healthy as they're sitting in these clunky goggles. How can you make that better? How can you help differently abled people enjoy this space as well? This morning, I was on Clubhouse talking to a blind photographer who's a pretty amazing guy. And through NFTs, he's been able to sell his artwork in a way that he never has before. And as we were talking, um, we were trying to figure out ways that he can enter the metaverse and not make it too complicated for those who can't see. Coming into VR without sight is something people want. How can we make that happen for them? How can we make it make sense for them? So I would say, the world is yours as you move forward. Don't just try to replicate what you did in Web 2 in real life. You can create so much more. I was just hired to design a wedding dress for a friend in the metaverse. She's getting married in December. I am super excited. The train will come to life, literally. I'm planning on butterflies releasing from her gown at the end of the ceremony. I'm going to need a developer for that. <laughs> I'm going to need to up my blender skills. But I'm really looking forward to it. And you can do it too. Don't just recreate a t-shirt. Don't just recreate a jacket, a pair of trainers. Do something more. Why not create mountain goat legs for people who want to climb in the metaverse instead of just a cool pair of shorts? So thank you all so much for listening, for being here, for being a part of this. And if there are any questions I can answer, some of you know I am secretly very shy. So. <laughs> All right. One question in the back. Hey, thanks for that presentation. Super interesting. I think my brain is like broken whenever I think of the metaverse. So uh, yeah, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm curious what the process of creation looks like uh, when you are, you know, for example, designing a wedding dress. Um, what programs, what skills? Uh, yeah, what does that look like? Well, it's definitely 3D design. I am using Blender. Uh, what I've done is to take the blank. She's going to get married in Somnium space. So I grab the blank from Somnium, and I'm building the dress on top of that. Thank you, Nadine. That was wonderful. Um, I'm wondering, since there are so many designers in the audience that are probably already designing and rendering in 3D, like Clo, you know, like what are some ways that they can start leveraging the work they're already doing in terms of like segueing into the metaverse or designing, you know, second skins or digital avatar kind of outfits? You know, like what's some opportunities there for, for designers? That's a great question. There are tons of opportunities. If you are a brand that already has a following and there are people who want to wear a Supreme jacket in the metaverse, you can leverage that community and say, hey, here's our, well, first I would say, find out where they are. Some people are in Decentraland, some people are in CryptoVoxel, some people are in the Sandbox, some people are in every space imaginable. And you can put stores in each space. You can partner up with someone who has an existing store and say, hey, can I do a special event in your store next month? In some cases, you may get to rent the space. You can rent spaces in the metaverse. And in some cases, they may offer it for free if you you know, throw them a wearable or two in exchange or get more people into their space, sort of uh, pump it up so that there's more feet on the ground that makes a difference in your spaces. For designers, it, it all goes back to community. Everything in the space goes back to community. Who are you talking to? Who are you meeting? Those are the people that you're selling to. There are people who are in here for a money grab, but if you have people who follow you, who love what you do as a brand, as an individual, 
Those are the people you can sell to right now. And those are the people can, who can also help you grow. I was in a conversation yesterday as part of my DAO, and we were asking the community, what more do you want from us? And the suggestions that came from multiple sources helped us elevate the DAO in a way that we had not expected. We couldn't do it by ourselves. It, unfortunately, I have to use this phrase, but it takes a village. Next question. Yeah, you, you talked a lot about uh, this need for kind of experimentation and trying to, or, well, basically you are encouraging people to do more, don't just, don't just recreate something that's um, existing in the world. Do you think, I guess my question is, do you think, um, or how do you think that's gonna play out like move, as we move into the future? Is this, is this because this is a world of experimentation right now and we're just trying to stretch and test the boundaries or do you think it's gonna become more refined or what are your thoughts on that? At the beginning of every century, there is this moment of emergence of creativity. And when you think about the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, how much creativity was out there on an individual basis. People were building cars in their garages. Electric cars existed. And then something happened as we started to move towards very centralized ways of being. So it became one company creating cars for the masses instead of the individual brands. And what I hope for and what a lot of people expect in this space is decentralization, where it's not just one company providing everything, but you can choose the multiple spaces or where you wanna be and who you wanna be with and find people that are agreeable to you. The upside to this is you really find the people who warm your heart, the people who encourage you, the people who elevate you. The downside to this is that everybody's in, including the people that you may disagree with or have different political views. Everyone is welcome. I think this will be a good thing for humans in general. It will be hard. A lot of people will build silos that only people that they like are welcomed into, but I think within a generation or two, if we continue moving towards this direction, it will help people globally. One story that I think of in the middle of COVID, again, I was in a clubhouse room, and there was a young man from India, I think he was in a small town outside of Chennai, and he talked about selling his first NFT ever. And the difference that it made for him was that his mom had gotten sick. It was during that huge, awful wave that went through India. He didn't have enough money to pay for her bills. They were about to get evicted. Selling that NFT paid his mother's hospital bills, kept a roof over their head, fed him and his little brothers and sisters for months. That is the difference in this world. And I think as we encourage more of that, the individual success and not just the big money grabs, it'll be a better thing. But we have to really work hard for it. What a wonderful speech that you did. You, so fantastic, you're so well-spoken and just learning such a complex um, concept of, again, metaverse. Thank you so, so much. Um, I love all this kind of stuff so much and I feel like a lot of people tell me, but Allison, like, we need to have human connection. Like, we can't live in this other space, and they're so anti this other dimension. So I'm curious what your, like, what you fight back with, what you tell people, what's the positive impact of this world going forward? It's a complicated question because there's, a lot of people say there's a huge environmental impact because of NFTs and crypto, and there are people who argue the exact opposite. So it goes back to Dior. Uh, as I continue to do my research, there, it goes back and forth. What I tell people that I encounter who are down on the space, and I have friends who are artists in real life who think NFTs are an absolute scam. We don't talk about it. It's like politics at Thanksgiving and we still love each other. I tell people, get in when you're ready. You know, if you wanna sit back and watch and wait, 
It's what I did with Bitcoin. Someone told me to buy it in 2009. I said, well, what is it? He couldn't tell me. I did my own research. Five years later, I bought and I was happy. And I know other people who did their research and decided, nah, I don't want to. And they're still happy. It's, it's open to buying in. It's open to not buying in. The benefits, I can tell so many stories about charities raising money. Right now, people are helping people in Ukraine. They're helping people in Venezuela. They're helping people in Yemen. All of these areas are going through wars and children dying. Money is being raised to help them, just instantly, in a way that's wonderful. The downside is regulations are shifting. The EU just passed a new law and I'm still trying to get all of the details on it because it probably will affect the US as well, uh, regulating uh, crypto exchanges. You have to dox the people that you're giving or receiving money from, which is very anti the space. It's about privacy. It's about, I don't know, there's a lot going on. And the tax laws recently changed in the USA too. A lot of people, similar to the bubble in 2008 that I remember, Oh, a whole lot of taxes that they didn't realize, only because of fiat, because they took money out. They bought crypto at a certain spot, a certain height. Um, they sold it at a different height. You have to pay taxes on it. They bought an NFT when it was worth $100. They sold it when it was worth 10000 You have to pay taxes on that, especially if you cash out. I would say that I'm sorry, I feel like I'm rambling. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would say this space is about letting people be themselves. Just you be you is what I constantly say to people. If you want to get in, great. If you don't want to get in, great. You love it, you hate it. I think Gary Vee is a scam artist. But I have friends who are Vivi friends, and I'm not going to argue with them. They love it. They're thriving. I don't like bored apes. There's sort of a frat boy culture there that makes me uncomfortable. I have tons of friends who own apes, and they are happy as clams at high tide. And I'm not going to tell them to be otherwise. We're all good. <laughs>